Today we're going to start talking about rotational inertia. It's a very important topic. So, uh, like we talked about before, when we're going in a circle, when an object is rotating, which happens a lot, that's why we're talking about it. Anytime a wheel rolls, anytime you really throw something in the air and it starts to spin, it's very important. So, we talked about angular acceleration, angular velocity, uh, and angular displacement. But when you spin things around, you also get a different... Mass does something different, and that's what rotational inertia is. Another name for it is moment of inertia. So, when we talk about mass linearly, we talk about mass, as physicists, as resistance to a change in motion. And we define mass as inertia. That's a very important part of what mass is. Um... Another way to say that is it's a resistance to an acceleration. Uh, anytime we want to speed an object up, slow an object down, turn it left, turn it right, um, make it go in a circle, we have to fight against this resistance. It wants to go in a straight line, and we have to change it from that straight line. We're pushing against inertia. Another way to talk about that is sluggishness. So mass has this inherent sluggishness to it. Um, And the important thing that we've been doing with this is treating all masses as a point mass. So for straight line motion, any mass that we talk about just didn't matter. It was always a point. It was a point moving, a mass. Um, we didn't care how big it was or how big it sp spun. We just reduced it down to a point. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that anymore because in rotational inertia, things get a little bit different. So when we talk about Rotational inertia, or moment of inertia is what most books will call it, rotational inertia is a resistance to a change in angular velocity. Basically, it's a resistance to a change in the spinning motion of an object. Uh, so imagine, imagine holding a ruler in your hand and twisting it back and forth really quick. Any resistance that you have to push against while you do that that's you pushing up against the rotational inertia of an object. So if you set an object spinning, it's going to want to continue spinning at that constant rate um, until something else stops it. So rotational inertia is resistance to a change in angular motion um, or resistance to a change in... resistance to a twist or a turn. That's how we need to think of rotational inertia or rotational sluggishness. So in class, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about some examples of this and allowing you to feel differences in rotational inertia between different objects. Um, so, when you twist an object, just like I was saying, um, or move it in a circle, you should notice some sluggishness. When the object's harder to twist or less hard to twist, that's changes in rotational inertia. And so we can feel it, and that's important. We also have to calculate with it. So just looking at an example, you have to think about this a little bit. Imagine holding a baseball bat. All right? The mass, regardless of where you hold the bat you still have the same mass to deal with. So, you know, if you hold the bat down by the handle, so, regardless of where you hold the bat, you feel the same sluggishness uh, when you are moving it in a straight line. So if you hold it down by the handle and just move it back and forth in a straight line or up and down, you feel the same sluggishness as if you held it at the end of the bat and moved it up and down or side to side. It doesn't really matter where you hold it, you kind of feel the same mass. But if you were to twist the bat, so when we talk about rotational inertia, even though it has the same mass regardless of where you hold it, um, the bat is going to be harder or easier to twist depending on where you hold it. So it's, it's really easy to turn it when you hold the end, when you grip close to the center of the mass of the bat, it's much harder when you grip closer to the handle. 
And again, we'll play with we'll play with that idea so that you can really feel differences in in this rotational inertia. So, rotational inertia depends on two things. One of those things is how much mass you have. That's still a very important factor. The other thing is where that mass is located, or how far away that mass is from the center of rotation, or from the pivot point. That's going to be very obvious to us where these objects are going to be twisting and turning. Uh, it's either going to be about the center of mass of the object, which for us is going to be in the dead center, or it's going to be about um, a specific pivot of an object kind of pinned down. So, how much mass you have affects the rotational inertia, and how far that mass is from the pivot affects the rotational inertia. So, the pivot is the point of rotation. So for an object or a system, it's the point of rotation. And naturally, an object will rotate about its center of mass. So if you take your pencil and spin it on a table, that point that looks... sorry, If there is no external pivot or external axis, the object will naturally rotate about that center mass. You spin your pencil on the table, and the part of your pencil that doesn't look like it's moving very much is the center of mass. That's the center of the rotation of an object. If you roll a ball down uh, across a surface, the center of rotation is the center of mass of the ball. So our basic formula for this is that I, the moment of inertia, the rotational inertia, we use an I because we're using that inertia word, is equal to the mass times r squared, where r is the distance away from the pivot point. And that's really, 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 really important. r, in fact, has the biggest effect on the moment of inertia. So the farther you take that mass from the center of rotation, the harder it is to spin the object, the more rotational inertia we have. And the closer and closer and closer we put our mass to the center of the object, the smaller moment of inertia we have, the less rotational inertia, the less rotational sluggishness we have. It's much easier when the mass is much, much closer in. So, I stands for our rotational inertia. M is for our mass. And then R squared is that distance from the pivot, from the mass to the pivot. This is just kind of reiterating everything I just said. The rotational inertia of a point mass, this is just for one single mass around a pivot point. If we were talking about something like a stick or a wheel, it's continuous and we have to do some tricks to get it. Uh, and those tricks are a little bit mathematically difficult for us this year. Uh, so if you stick with me for next year, we'll, we'll get... We'll get a way to calculate those, but for now, uh, it, it serves as a single mass around a pivot, um, and it's going to kind of help us think through how other massive objects work. So our big idea here, and this is the thing that we really need to hold on to for a moment of inertia, the more mass we have, the bigger our moment of inertia. The more mass we have, the bigger our rotational inertia. And the more distance, the farther away we are from the pivot, the bigger rotational inertia we have. Less mass, less rotational inertia. Closer to the center of rotation, the less rotational inertia we have. So an object with a bigger moment of inertia, the object with a bigger rotational inertia, is harder to twist. So let's keep that in mind. So, if we talk about a stick at one end, again, we can't do this I equals mR squared because the mass is distributed all along the radius. Um, and so 
there's our stick. If our pivot is right there, and it's a uniform stick, the moment of inertia is one-third the mass of the stick times the length of the stick squared. Because a lot of the mass is kind of away from that pivot point. If we look at the stick at its center, before we get into it, so the pivot's at the dead center, looking at it, more of the mass of the stick is closer to the pivot now. More of my mass is closer inside. Even though it's the same mass then, it should have a smaller rotational inertia. Uh, and when we do the math on it to calculate it, and when you hold the stick, you, you can feel intuitively that it has smaller moment, um, rotational inertia. Looking at that, Again, the, closer, the pivot is closer to the center of mass, so we should have a small rotational inertia, and we do. That rotational inertia comes out to be one-twelfth the mass of the stick times the entire length of the stick squared, um, which is much smaller than one-third. So again, as we see us moving more mass towards the center, we see the rotational inertia getting smaller. So, there are three round shapes that are really important for us to talk about right now. Uh, one of them is a ring, and on a ring you have all of your mass out towards the outside. Another one is a disc, and with a disc, it's a solid object, so the mass is uh, evenly distributed from the outside to the inside. And a disc uh, has the same rotational inertia as a, uh, as a cylinder. A cylinder is just a really thick disc. And then the last one we talk about is a sphere, a solid sphere. We kind of need to understand how the moment of inertia of each one of these things works. So, if we assume that for all of these, the ring, the disc, and the sphere have the same mass and the same radius, we can see the mass distribution really... As we move down from a ring to a disc to a sphere, we see that the mass gets closer and closer and closer to the center. With the ring, all of that mass is a radius away. With the disc, it's kind of spread throughout, so it's smaller. We have more mass closer to the center. And then with the sphere, even more mass is located closer to the center of mass. So we should see the moment of inertia getting smaller, and we do. So for a ring, all that mass is out on the outside and the moment of inertia is mr squared, the mass of the ring times the radius of the ring squared. For a disc, again that's solid, so we've spread more mass throughout the inside, the moment of inertia is one half mr squared. In a sphere, it's two fifths mr squared. So, a sphere is the easiest of those three to spin around because it's has its mass closer and closer to the center. It has the smallest rotational inertia. Now, this is really important because when we start talking about force, when we start talking about force and, and rotational inertia, it's, it's really important to see um, how these things affect each other. So linearly, forces accelerate objects. And we have net force equals mass times acceleration. In rotation, um, forces cause acceleration. In rotation, we have torques. These cause angular acceleration. So they cause objects to twist. Forces accelerate, torques twist. Acceleration's in a straight line. Angular acceleration is around a circle. And for this, Newton's second law looks like the net torque acting on an object equals the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. Net force is equal to the linear inertia, what we call the mass, times the acceleration. Torque is the rotational inertia, and we're just going to call it rotational inertia, times the angular acceleration. So the bigger our rotational inertia, the more force we need to achieve a specific acceleration, or the harder it is to turn an object. So this tau is torque. I, again, is for our rotational inertia. And alpha, A, is for our angular acceleration. So, torque 
with that Tau is a force applied to an object to cause a twist in that object, to cause a rotation. So torque is R times F. Uh, we want to apply that force away from the pivot, because if we apply the force directly at the pivot, it's not going to cause any rotation, it's just going to cause the object to move in a straight line. So we apply a torque somewhere away from the pivot, and that's what R stands for, how far away from the pivot we are. And it has to cause it to rotate. So R is the distance from the force to the pivot point. And a really important thing about this is that it really works better when that force is perpendicular. So if we look at force 1, force 2, and force 3 acting on this pivot point, <coughs> well, let's, let's just kind of explore what's going on. So force 1, force 2, and force 3, that's all assume that they're the same size. But let's look at the torques from each of them. So torque 1 is going to be less than torque 2 because force 2 is further from the pivot. I can do more twisting if I push further away from the pivot. It's much easier to turn. That's why door handles are on the outside. It's easier to turn a door handle that way. And we can play with that a little bit in class 2. Um, and then, so even though force 1 and force 2 are the same, the torque from force 2 is bigger, larger, because force 2 is farther away from the pivot. The farther we are from the pivot, the more we have. Now torque 3 from force 3 is equal to 0. So if we, if we look at that force, force 3, it's not ever going to cause that object to twist. And that's an interesting idea. That force has to have some 90 degree component. So force 3 cannot cause a twist and is therefore not going to give us any torque. So only forces perpendicular to the radius or to the line of action, we'll talk about that a little bit, cause a torque. They must have some part of that force perpendicular to the line of action. So a line of action is a line drawn along the radius of our object. Any line extending from the pivot along an object's radius. So if you look at that, force 1 and force 2 are perpendicular to that line of action. Force 3 is parallel to it. So only the perpendicular part of forces count.